a screw coming out my desk. Ooh. Oh, well, I can't bother to deal with that right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's like every day of my life. <laughs> so how have you been, Matt, since we last spoke? I don't know. We, we spend so much time away from each other. That I know. We, you know, conversation just flows freely whenever we speak, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I just Shit, I have to speak to this guy every week. Trump? Mm, it's been done really. It's very mm. pedestrian now, isn't he? Mm. <sighs> um what else can we talk about? Um uh, <sighs> Dunno, the the weather's been rough lately. Oh, it has, know, I, it? I, I don't know what to dress for. Um, yes, it must be awful. Yeah, like, like and that global warming thing, man. Seriously. Yeah. That's, uh, okay. I, I never know what dress to put on in the morning nowadays. No, no. It's terrible. I don't know what boxes to wear. Yeah. It's just a sweat keeps everything sticking. If it's silky, my balls will just stick to the boxes. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, you do, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> You sounded like an expert then. Uh, yeah, I always have to like keep readjusting in public because that's that's what people with balls do. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter who's around. I I always have to just go ahead and do it. How exactly do you do that? I I, I slip my hand down on my trousers, um, mm. in public, even though there are people there, and readjust my balls and think it's okay to touch things. Wow. There's quite a lot of detail there, Tom. Yeah. I fear this role-playing has got quite serious. The, the readjustment of balls is not disgusting or unhygienic at all. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. Uncomfortable, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. What else? Like, oh, that, that's so, a good topic. I'm so bored of talking to you. <laughs> oh, it's, just, it's just so boring. Yeah, there's literally nothing else to say to each other. No. If only we had a topic of like conversation in mind. When we decide to start recording. Oh, I've got a question for you. What? Do you, when you have apple pie or apple crumble... Are you going to ask me if I have cream with it? <laughs> yeah. Do you prefer <laughs> custard or cream? Is this what you were talking about before we started no, recording? The that, joke you wanted to use? What kind of catchphrase is that? Oh, okay. Well, I, I don't really like apple pie. What? I don't like apple pie. Oh, shut up. I mean, I've, I'll have it if like that's the only thing I'm going to eat, but if I have choice of that and something else you're i'll go for something else you you're not a human being yes i'm okay with it mm. i don't know how you can not like apple pie i don't know it's just all mushy i don't know i've just ruined your joke haven't i no oh, that's a shame i all all i wanted to know was you know whether you had cream or custard but you don't so uh, i hey i have i have a preference between cream and custard i like custard ah. but then i also like cream <laughs> Yeah. So I'm not fussy. <laughs> so basically, I don't have a preference. Yeah. This this is really cutting-edge stuff, isn't it? Yeah. We really should start thinking about what we're going to talk about beforehand. Yeah. That indicates professionalism, though. Yeah, but no one's paying us to do shit. No. So why should I be professional? Yeah, exactly. I think I do more than enough. I, I upload the episodes. I tweet the episodes. I Facebook the episode. I tweet shitty conundrums that Chris sends me. I tweet about editing episodes and what we discuss as, like, teasers. I actually edit the fucking episodes, don't I? What else do I do? My God. Yeah. For heaven's sake. I, I think the listeners get more than they deserve, to be honest. Exactly. I pay for this every fucking year. And I always forget to tell you to pay me. <laughs> so, Matt... Hurry up and pay me. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> For the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> you paid me the first year. You haven't paid me anything since then. You bosses, you and Chris, you fucktards. That's your, that's your failing. You forgot to tell us. Okay, fine. I'm telling you now. You and Chris. You, you owe me back rent for the opportunity and the space to be in this podcast. Oh, what, what, what the honour of being in yeah. this podcast has to be I pay £75 a year for this. God. So, so not only am I paying and editing and doing all that shit, and the listeners, you're still not fucking happy, are you? What more do you want? Do you want my blood? Well, you can have it because it's useless to me. <laughs> I'm sure at some point it's it's got to be of some use. I... I'm so dead certain 
that if I tried to donate blood, they wouldn't accept it because it's useless. It would just probably make people sicker. <laughs> mm. Interesting theory. I think we should try this out one day. <laughs> yeah. The next blood drive I go to, I'll try it out. <laughs> we, we should just go to like the give blood people and say, you can have all this blood, but you've got to determine whether it's useful or not. <laughs> Could you imagine me trying to give the world a helping hand by donating my blood? And then I get a phone call saying, by the way, you've got like 10 types of cancer. That would be bad luck. Yeah, that would be terrible luck. But you did get a biscuit at the end, so, you know. And so they give you a bit... Well, they have to, because you're, you're going to be weak. You need blood sugar. Yeah. I think, I think blood sugar's the technical term. Yeah, yeah, probably. Who gives a shit? Yeah. I mean, you know, would you want to know who would know the technical term? A doctor that eats cream. Oh, is that, is that a se- attempt at a segue? Well, it's doctor. We were talking about sugar. He's got cream in his name. It would have worked if he was Dr. Sugar. Oh, sugar. Dr. You Sweet. You should really leave these segues to me, Tarman. <laughs> You're so shit at <laughs> Yours aren't even a segue. <laughs> I could be talking about a cow getting raped by a horse, and your segue would be, or do you, do you like bridges? What the hell are you Your talking? segues aren't smooth. That's what I'm saying. I think my segues are brilliant, and that's the only opinion that matters. Your segues aren't smooth because you aren't smooth, Matt, unfortunately. I'm sorry I have to tell you this, but you're not smooth. I'm, I'm smooth as silk or something like you're that. You're as smooth as chunky peanut butter. <laughs> I hate peanut butter, so I do find that comparison offensive. So. I don't like peanut butter either, but it's the fact that I said chunky peanut butter, you dumbass. You, that just went right over your head. Yeah. Because it has chunks in it, so it's not smooth. You can get smooth peanut butter and you can get chunky peanut butter. I, I get it now. You like the orange juice that has the mushroom. All right, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Have we had intro You like yet? nacho cheese that hasn't really been heated oh, up. Oh, fuck off. Sorry. You lumpy. <laughs> It's late. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to cyber kill you at some point. <laughs> cyber killing. Oh, yeah. That reminds me. I watched that movie, Unfriended. I didn't actually hate it. I thought I was going to hate it. I actually quite liked it. Does he actually unfriend them in the film? What? Do you not know what the film's about? No? Got no clue. Okay. Well, so it's basically we're watching a Skype conversation pretty much. Oh, that sounds Between a group of people. Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> between a group of people and then there's this one person that's in the conversation that hasn't been added and she's in there and I don't know if it's like a ghost of the person that they pushed to, they bullied to suicide. Mm. But mm. Um, yeah, and then like people die and it's a, it's a peculiar type of horror movie but I actually quite enjoyed it. I thought I'd hate it because it's basically a Skype conversation. But yeah, it was quite interesting. What country? Uh, it's a US film. Oh. And obviously they can do a sequel, which will probably be really yeah. shit. Yeah. So that kind of thing sounds like almost Japanese. I mean, we yeah. were discussing that before, weren't we? In another episode. They yeah, do like last shit. week. Yeah. It was definitely only last week. Yeah, it definitely wasn't a couple of hours ago. It was last week. Yeah. Why would it be a couple of hours ago, man? I know. Yeah. So anyway, these people died in the film. People die in this podcast. Well, not specifically in the podcast but <laughs> well actually no we've killed off annie and we've killed off chris ah uh, yeah but they've both come back as ghosts so that they're basically unfriended aren't they yeah they're, they're the characters in unfriended we are unfriended in real life my god we talk through skype as we're recording and two of our friends have been killed not by two us, of us have sure. gone down yeah. that movie unfriended is about us wow shit we didn't get paid the rights to our story it's Brilliant to finally see our life story put on film without us knowing of all things. So, yeah, but the problem is that the lead character's quite hot and I'm quite not. Oh, well, I, I can fill in there. Yeah, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, I say we do that that, that music. <sighs> oh, that music. Yeah, I think it's time. Welcome to the Dork's Deduction Podcast. Where we talk about stuff. Do you think it's over now? I hope so. Yeah, it's awful. okay, thank you. It's awful yeah, music. Thank God. Yeah. Okay. We really need to sort that out. It's just ugh, two years, a hundred and something episodes with that music. Yeah. My 
God, for heaven's sake. How do we put up with it? I don't know. Maybe it's because we edit it in afterwards, so we don't actually have to listen to it while we're recording. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I think if we had to listen to it, it'd, just, it'd make this kind of episode torture, wouldn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, technically, I kind of do have to listen to it because I'm editing it, so... Yeah. So, yeah, I might go insane and botch some abortions and shit. Ah, smooth. Smooth as caramel. So that's what you get up to in your room. Yeah, I'm a, I'm an abortionist, even though abortion is perfectly legal in the UK. Yeah. As it should be everywhere else, because it's nobody's business but the person whose body it is. <sighs> Yeah, so I just did a little bit of political ranting there <laughs> before we get into it. And it wasn't really ranting, it's just me. Mm. Mm. I live to impart wisdom. <laughs> anyway, so this week we are talking about the... He was such a great man. He trained as a doctor and a specialist surgeon. And he lived to see people live. He didn't go around murdering people at all. No. Because doctors don't do that. They have a duty of care. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great man. Howard Chapman was just, you know, he was just being loving, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, like... Special yeah. kind of caring. Yeah, to those old people. Yeah. Yeah, he was like an angel of death rather than just death. Yeah. Dr. Death. Mm. He looked quite friendly as well. You know, that beard and stuff like that. This guy, I don't think he looks that friendly. He's got quite a magnificent moustache, though, I think. Th- these days, I think he'd be a hipster murderer. Oh, my God, he so would. He looks like a hipster. <laughs> he is totally a hipster. People would love him these days, especially with that surname. Hey, the general public don't like hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> hipsters don't like other hipsters. They yeah. all think they're too cool for them. <laughs> so no one ends up liking hipsters. Yeah. I'm sorry to tell you, hipsters. No one likes you. Yeah. Yeah, what was it last week when we talk about bullying, online bullying and stuff? Oh, we, yeah, we better go easy on that kind of stuff. Yeah, like at least for a couple of episodes. <laughs> so people can forget that we were being a bit sentimental last week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so this episode we're going to be talking about Thomas Neil Cream, who was a doctor that didn't really care for his patients too much. No. And not as in, oh, I don't really care, I'm just going to prescribe you something so you can leave me alone. And just to put your mind at ease when there's nothing actually wrong with you, hypochondriac. They're basically kind of my doctors that I just described. (laughs) I'm joking. They're my mother's doctors that that I just described. (laughs) (laughs) Um, He was a doctor of death, man. Let's just be frank. Yeah. So he is known to have killed at least 10 people. At the very least, 10 people. That's quite a lot. And he... Yeah, and he was an international doctor. Yeah, he got, got about a bit, didn't he? He really did. Like, I was surprised to see how many places he, he was in. So, Dr. Thomas Neal, he was born in 1850. So, I apologise if I keep saying 19. It's <laughs> definitely 18. I don't mean to cause any confusion, but I do that sometimes do. when we're doing something from centuries ago. <laughs> I forget the century. So it's 1850 he was born in, and he was born in Glasgow, Scotland. At the age of four, he and his family of nine, I think, not nine, I think it was a family of ten, so the two parents and eight kids. So he and his family of ten moved to Quebec in Canada. Eventually, he went to McGill University in Montreal, also in Canada, and to study that doctoring business. Medicine in general, wasn't it? And he graduated with an MDCM degree, which is Latin for Medicine Doctorum et Chinegre <laughs> Magistrum, which means a doctor of medicine and master of surgery. I'm so great with the Latin, have you noticed? Yeah, I'm glad you did that bit. <laughs> yeah. Before today, the only Latin I knew was an exorcism. <laughs> That's supernatural yeah. watching for you. Exorcisamus te amnes immundus. Spiritus, yeah, Omnis yeah. Satanica, yeah, and that kind of Latin, that's the Latin I know. <laughs> okay, so he was a doctor. He graduated being a doctor, doing doctoring, that type of thing. So he graduated in 1876. Mm. Also in 1876, he impregnated a lady named Flora Brooks 
and he gave her an abortion, which was very risky, and she almost died. Obviously, her father was furious yeah. and insisted he marry her, which he did, and she supposedly died in 1877 of consumption. However, in 1876, he travelled to London to study at St. Thomas's Hospital, which is a teaching hospital. So I don't know what quite happened, because she died in 1977. I don't know if he went back and forth, because he's later believed to have killed her. Either she travelled with him, or he went back. Who knows? He He did did the 19 again. Fuck. I'm glad I said that thing at the beginning. Whenever I say 19, just think 18. I'm not going to repeat what I was saying. (laughs) So, yeah, he travelled in 1876 to study medicine at St. Thomas's Hospital. When I say medicine, I guess it's just like the on the job training that people do because you know you study medicine beforehand in a classroom and then you go into a hospital environment and train there. Yeah. So he later got a qualification in being a physician and a surgeon in Edinburgh in 1878. So yeah, moving around a lot. Following that, he moved back to Canada based in London, Ontario. So don't get confused. It's like the South Wales and the world in the sea. Don't get confused. Don't get yeah. confused. He's an idiot. He just travels yeah. around so much. Doesn't uh, he? <laughs> that's the least of it. In 1879, a woman named Kate Gardner was found behind Cream's office, pregnant, and she had been poisoned by chloroform. It later emerged that Kate was his mistress. Oh, I didn't read that. It's assumed that she was his mistress. Ah. Uh, but there was no hard evidence. So possibly he could have been the father of the child. I mean, he's got formed, isn't he? He didn't want to clear clearly. Yeah. He performed an abortion on Flora beforehand. Following the murder, Cream, he actually accused another local businessman of getting her pregnant. Yeah, that's something that kind of fascinates me because that comes quite a habit, doesn't it? He actually tried blackmailing the businessman as well, Mm. but that didn't work out too well for him because then he was being thought of as a murderer as well as a blackmailer. Yeah. He fled to the United States in Chicago. Ah, he can move around freely back home. He really could. Sounds very easy. (laughs) Yeah. Compared to now. Yeah, just wait. It's not even begun. Yeah. He moved to the United States and based himself in Chicago, Illinois. And he opened a practice in a red light district area of Chicago. (laughs) So the red light district was obviously full of prostitutes and he offered them abortions. So that's a great way to segue his medical career. Yeah. Because he could have done a lot of things. I'm assuming that people didn't know he was a murderer. Yeah. But he decided to be an abortionist. Maybe he just wanted the prostitutes to owe him one so that whenever he was feeling lonely, he could knock on their door. It's clever in a way. It's kind of seeing that that's a good place where, you know, he might be able to do his business there. Mm. Yeah, that's true. He's probably trying to remain underground as well. Yeah. If he's going around killing these people. Allegedly at this point, yeah. might I add. In August 1880, a prostitute named Mary Ann Faulkner died. And he was investigated for it. But he he escaped that because there wasn't any evidence like the Kate Gardner situation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Another patient of his. I don't have the first name for this one. Mm. She's just referred to as Miss or Ms. Stack. I assume that because she's like, I don't want to be disparaging of the dead, but she is probably a nobody. Nobody cared enough to give her a first name. Yeah. And it happens. And it's, it's sad truth, especially yeah. back then as well. Yeah, that's still now. Yeah. So Miss Stack, she died after treat, having treatment with cream. And he actually accused the pharmacist of the wrongdoing and tried blackmailing him as well. <laughs> <laughs> In between his abortionist duties, he practiced his own type of medicine. He thought he'd actually come up with an elixir for ep- epilepsy. And in doing so, he attracted the attention of Daniel Stott, who was an elderly... I say elderly, I think he was in, around, in his 60s, early 60s at, his, at the time of his death. Yeah. Daniel Stott was interested in his goods. And he'd often send his wife to Thomas Neal Cream's place of business to collect the elixir. The reason this is a bad idea is because she started having it off Ah, with Thomas Neal. It's always bad news. It's (laughs) always bad news. So they started shagging, and she basically wanted to bump off her husband. Her husband, I think, began suspecting the affair, possibly. I've read Mm. in a couple of places. So she obviously went to her boyfriend for help. He placed some strychnine in his elixir, 
which Daniel, stop. If you're thinking that this guy is having an affair with your wife, why are you still taking the drugs he's given you? Yeah. It's silly, Daniel, okay? I mean, he knows that now, obviously. He's suffered the effects. <laughs> it's strychnine is like an alkaloid that's usually used to kill rodents and things. So it must have been a high dose as well. He should have been able to taste the difference, really. Um, is it one of those ones that's quite tasteless, though? I have no idea. I've never actually tried eating strychnine. I've grown fond of living sometimes. Sometimes I've grown fond of living, not all the time. (laughs) But, yeah, I've never tried it. But aren't alkaloids usually smelly at least? Um, If you put them in something that disguises the smell, though. Mm. Okay, well, maybe not. So, he obviously Daniel took that because he trusted the man that he he, he thought he was having an affair with his wife. (laughs) He took that and died. Mm. And the death was ruled natural causes because how deep could they really go into a cause of death in the 1800s? Also, I think straightening was pretty hard to... I seem to remember hearing something about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking the tests weren't exactly up to the standards they are now. Yeah. And even now, sometimes it's hard to detect Yeah. how someone died if it's through poisoning, depending on the poison. It was ruled death by natural causes, but... For some reason, this guy makes me want to hit myself in the face. I don't understand how he got away with it for so I long. Know. Cream actually wrote a letter to the coroner and again accused someone else of doing it and tried to blackmail it. So this person, again, was another pharmacist mm. that he was blackmailing. So the pharmacist must have said, piss off. <laughs> and then Thomas Neil Cream wrote the letters to the coroner. Did he not think it'd be weird, like, he'd be connected to so many murders? Uh, well, obviously they mustn't share records, right? Because well, the Flora death, the Kate Gardner death, mm. I mean, the only ones they could connect him to were um, Marianne and uh, Miss Stack, because they're the ones that happened in the US. Yeah. Um, I doubt they would have known about Kate Gardner or Flora. I guess. Well, this was a bit fishy. So they did investigate him, and eventually Mrs. Stott, her first name was Julia, so Mrs. Stott, his girlfriend, the wife of Daniel Stott, eventually gave a testimony against Cream, and that ended up landing Cream in prison for life, which I don't really, I don't understand how she got away with it. I mean, she asked for it, so she colluded. It was attempted murder. She's the one that gave him the shit. People have gone to prison for less. Yeah, I don't know. Back then, it was different at times, though, wasn't it, though? Yeah. So he was sentenced to life in prison, and he was placed in Joliet, Joliet, I guess it is called, prison in Illinois. So he was sentenced to life in prison, so obviously he got out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So after 10 years, he was released in 1891, July 1891, after his brother campaigned for his release and pleaded for leniency and allegedly, I say allegedly, I'm pretty sure it's true, actually bribed people to get him out. Would not surprise me. Uh, Following his release, he went back to Canada, collected inheritance from his father who had passed away, uh, which was, I think, $16,000, which is a lot of money. Yeah, back then it certainly would have been. Um, Following the collection of the inheritance, he decided to come back to London and haunt their streets for a little while, and settled in Lambeth. Uh, At that time, it wasn't exactly the most affluent area. It was kind of like a red light district in Chicago. So assumption is he got up to the same business he got up to in Chicago, but rather than killing women through abortions and remedies like that, he just outright killed them. Nasty fellow. Nasty, nasty fellow. His first victim when he came back to London was Ellen Dunworth, who was also known as Nellie. She was only 19 years old, and she was a prostitute. Her only crime was to accept a drink from Thomas Neal. Cream. Yeah. I keep forgetting his surname, his last name's Cream. His own, her only crime was to accept a drink, which everyone's done. Everyone's accepted a drink from someone. So, yeah. girls, watch out. And guys, watch out, because guys can get raped too. Yeah. And murdered. Watch out uh, is 
the cream. Yeah. yeah. I live for the cautionary tales I tell people on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't don't accept a drink. You could either get raped or murdered. Yeah. Yeah, it's true though, isn't it? It's good advice. Yeah. Always buy your own drink. Mm. Actually, always make your own drinks. I think it's better advice. Yeah. So Ellen Dunworth, she accepted a drink from him. It doesn't seem like she went home with him, fucked him for money. She just accepted a drink. Um, so in that drink, he had actually p- placed strychnine. And three days later, it took her three days to die. On the 16th of October, she died. It's, it's meant to be quite a painful way to die as well, isn't it? Yeah. So she fell severely ill and slowly died over the course of three days, which is horrible, just horrible. Mm. And it was only a few months after he was actually released from prison, so he's he's got balls. Yeah. Like, most people would just go quiet for a little while. Yeah, he, he got back into it quickly, didn't he? He's just a fucking idiot. Um, so in Nellie's murder, it was ruled strychnine poisoning. And Cream, again, decided to get involved. And he said the owner of W.H. Smith Bookstalls, I'm assuming that's the W.H. Smith that we have now, but I yeah, don't know. Yeah, I think so. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. so the owner of W.H. Smith Bookstalls, who was W.F.D. Smith, he accused him of murdering him and actually tried to blackmail him. And he wrote to the coroner, offering him the name of the person that actually killed her. Oh, is that for the 300,000 reward? Yeah, there was a, yeah, I probably should have mentioned that. There was a 300,000 pounds reward for any information related to the death of Nelly. That's a lot of money that they're putting up. I don't want to be disparaging to prostitutes. But a lot of money that they're putting up for prostitutes. Yeah. I don't know whether they've put that in today's money, maybe. Rather than... Maybe. That would make more sense. I cause... can't see that. At that time, that would be, like, loads. That would be, like, millions. Yeah. I think. Yeah, so it's probably today's money that they translated that to. Yeah. So, yeah, he again placed himself into the case when he wasn't a suspect and tried blackmailing people for it. So I guess that's his MO now. Yeah. Yeah. A week later, so on the 20, 20th of October, Cream interacted with a, another prostitute called Matilda Clover, and she was 27 years old. Uh, the next morning, she became ill and died. At first, her death was said to be alcohol poisoning of some sort or just because of alcoholism. So there wasn't really a case at that point because they just thought it was basically a natural cause. She did it to herself. Yeah. But cream, <laughs> cream, cream, cream. Uh, he accused a doctor, a doctor named William Broadbent, of actually poisoning her, and d- again tried to blackmail him for money. It's a weird thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of like drawing attention to yourself. It's not a yeah, very well, good way it, of it, hiding. Yeah, <laughs> and obviously Broadbent didn't pay out because he didn't have to because he didn't kill the girl. Yeah, he just forwarded the letter to Scotland Yard. To investigate. Yeah. Okay, so those two were in, those two murders were in close pro- proximity. Yeah. Um, the next one that we know of didn't happen until the following year. So he'd in between this time he'd gone back to Canada for vacation, which I don't understand because shouldn't he have been wanted for murder um, and blackmail? Yeah, but I, th- I think you know you probably do need a rest after a couple of murders, and then you know get back into it. Yeah, but my point is, he went back to Canada where he's wanted <laughs> yeah. for Kate Gardner's murder. Murderer, uh, he's wanted for Kate Gardner's murder and blackmail. So I don't understand how he managed to go, just go there for a quick holiday. They could have probably either just forgotten about it, or they haven't. Different parts of Canada might not have records. Possibly, possibly, yeah. Especially back then, it's not like an electronic system. So, yeah, on April the second, eighteen ninety-two, uh, he actually attempted to poison a Lou Harvey, who was formerly called Louise Harris, but she was actually suspicious of him and dumped the pills that he g- he gave her ah, off the bridge clever. of the River Thames. So, yeah, I don't think it doesn't say whether she was a prostitute or not. No, it doesn't. So she just might have been some random person or someone that actually went to him for help. She's married, so I don't know. Or she could be widowed, who knows? Yeah, true. It'd be... If if she was married, I think... I mean, even though they, they're still married people as prostitutes, it's still a bit risky if someone finds yeah. out you're mm, in trouble. True. 
Unless she's prostituting in a different area. Yeah. But who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Well, we're certainly not going to find out now, are we? No. Unless someone tells us, which you can via email. <laughs> um, so, obviously, he wasn't satisfied because he didn't get to murder this one, this lovely Lou woman who was smart enough to dump the shit he gave her. Yeah. So, a few days later, on April the 11th, he met with two prostitutes just to make up for lost time. <laughs> <clears throat> the prostitutes were Alice Marsh, who was 21 years old, and Emma Shrivel, who was 18. Somehow he managed to get into their flat, which, I'm sorry, but prostitutes, they're supposed to know better than that, right? You don't take a John back to your own place of business, or home, not even place of business. I don't know. If he's a doctor, though, he probably comes across as quite respectable. So, but still, yeah. that's the thing that prostitutes aren't supposed to do. That's why they have pimps, to stop uh, people from doing that. Yeah. This is and the old days, to have them so. beat up and stuff, but, yeah. Yeah. It's, it just seems a bit silly. Why would they let him... Maybe it's because there was two of them, so they thought, they thought it would be easier. He can't really do anything. Yeah. So they let him into their flat, where, for some reason, he offered them two bottles of Guinness each. They're, it's their duty to be hospitable and offer him drinks, yet he's the one giving them a couple of bottles of Guinness. Maybe that's why they let him in the house, though. They wanted good They wanted drink. a drink. Yeah. Possibly. So... Obviously, as Crean's M.O. now is, he had put strychnine in the bottles of Guinness and he just left and they died in agony by themselves. Ooh. And these two are the last known murders, I believe. They're the last known to happen, aren't they? I think. Yeah, they're the last known in chron chronological order because not long after that, he just decided to fuck himself over <laughs> completely. Uh, it didn't help that he tried to blackmail people and sent letters to the coroners of these different attacks, especially the one for Matilda, Matilda because that wasn't even ruled a murder. So instead of framing these people that he's trying to blackmail, the police actually cleared them of yeah. any wrongdoing. And and it highlighted the fact that he'd murdered people. They didn't believe that was <laughs> they were murdered. Yeah, I think it's a classic case where he's such an attention whore. He just needs to bring kind of attention to himself. When you're a murderer, if you want to get away with it, it's kind of screwing yourself there. Yeah. But I think the police must have linked these killings together then. Yeah. I guess it helped the left. Well, not him. It helped the police. Um, but he just couldn't keep his trap shut. Yeah. I mean, at this point, he was referred to as a Lambeth poisoner, yet he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Yeah. Did the police initially know that all these murders were connected? No, because he, especially in Matilda's case, they hadn't. Yeah, they hadn't even uh, thought it was a murder until he pipes up. Yeah, so you know, you just kind of—I I don't get his logic sometimes. I think he's just money hungry. I think that's it. It's not just glory; it's money. Yeah, I mean that also fits in with um, uh, Daniel Stott and Stott. I think no, Julia. That's his, his wife's name, isn't it, Julia? His, his, whose wife? Uh, uh, Daniel Stott, because oh, he yes. was apparently quite wealthy. Did Did we mention his his wife as well? The, Flora. Yeah. Did we mention the suspicion about that? Uh, yeah, but it's uh, actually I can't remember. Listeners, um, we should probably you know now this has actually taken us twenty four hours to record this episode, so it's hard for me to remember what I said right at the beginning of the story. But Flora, she passed away not long after their marriage, and it was initially assumed to be consumption, but in light of... Well, I think there was some suspicion of surrounding him at the beginning that he'd moved to London, and in light of all his other crimes, that murder has been linked to him. Yeah. That murder, that death has been linked to him. Particularly because I, I read that he told her to take only medicine prescribed by him as well oh i didn't read i don't think i read that it's, it's on another page i think it's not on the wikipedia one <laughs> uh, i don't just have the wikipedia one mate what, i'm not what's you. the other one you got? i've got plenty i've got huffington post i've got murder uk i've got the case book yeah and i've got another one and i've got my own notes fuck you matt why are you accusing me of wikipedia <laughs> like fuck you that's what you do <laughs> i write on my wikipedia pages with the sources of uh, and quotations from other websites, purely because Wikipedia is chronological. 
That's all I need from Wikipedia is the order things happened. Fuck you. I, Fuck I you, just Matt. noticed, you know, some of what you're saying similar to what was said on Wikipedia. It's not common. Yeah, it's also though. similar to what's said in every other page. Yeah, true. Web page <laughs> there is. <laughs> So yeah, there's there's suspicions about that, but we we we'll never really know actually about that one. So no, but I think it's safe to assume. But we saw what he turned into. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if he'd murdered her. Yeah, it wouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. So as I was saying, Cream just couldn't keep his mouth shut, and he he met with a police officer that was from New York. He was visiting London and decided to give him a tour of all the Lambeth poisonings. And he seemed to have information that he shouldn't have had, which was relayed to one of the Scotland Yard police. I think the New York police officer was called John Haynes, I think, but I only read that in one place, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Scotland Yard became suspicious and sent in a officer, undercover officer, I think his name was McIntyre, to put Cream under surveillance. And they connected him to prostitution as in he'd visited a lot of prostitutes. Yeah. And then they actually learned of his previous conviction from the United States. So there is free movement of information. You just have to ask for it. Yeah. So on June the 3rd, 1892, Cream was finally arrested for the murders, initially of Matilda Clover, which he's the one that brought attention to, (laughs) so that must sting. (laughs) And uh, about... Ten days later, on the 13th of July, he was charged with the murders of Dunworth, Marsh and Shrivel as well, and the attempted murder of Harvey, as well as blackmail, because he tried to blackmail loads of people that didn't do it. Yeah. And by doing that, let his town fall. <laughs> That's the really important one to get him on, though, isn't it? The blackmail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, his trial actually lasted only four days, uh, from the 17th of J- October to the 21st of October, and the jury only deliberated for 12 minutes, and they unanimously said that he was guilty, which is great. So why can't juries do that now? Yeah, but I, to be fair, it was hardly like there was very little evidence that he hadn't done it. Yeah, true. I mean, it's um, so obvious that he did it, I think. <laughs> yeah. So following the guilty verdict, he was sentenced to death by hanging. And it's so fast. Like, we've talked about it before. The timeline back then was so fast when it came <laughs> yeah. to convictions and stuff so less than uh, less than a month later on the 15th of november he was hanged at newgate prison which is in london by a james billington who has made a career well he made a career yeah he doesn't still exist he made a career out of hanging thomas neil cream is he quite a famous one billington you know how like pier point he was quite a famous hanger i don't really know much about the hangers but i think i've heard of james billington before yeah so Judging by the fact that I've heard of him, I'm assuming he's quite a famous one. Yeah. And then he was placed in an unmarked grave, which was fantastic. So, actually, during the trial, he decided to say that he wasn't the Thomas Neal Cream that was arrested and placed in prison in Illinois. He was just Thomas Neal, a good old family doctor. Oh, yeah, you know, try and pretend you're respectable and stuff like that. Yeah. And this has actually led to the theories post-death. Ah, this is the closest to Jack the Ripper we're ever going to get in the dog seduction. <laughs> yeah. Allegedly, Billington says that as he's hanging, as he's hung, I guess, that, that's the term of phrase, as he's doing the deed <laughs> to Thomas Neil Cream, apparently he shrieked, I'm Jack the... and then died. Ooh. And according to Billington, that is proof that he was the person that managed to hang Jack the Ripper. <laughs> he promoted this alleged incident, didn't he, though? Yeah, he promoted the shit out of it. I wonder if it, whether he like wrote a book or something like that. Probably did. I mean, Thomas Neil Cream's lawyer wrote a book about it. Yeah, that's what would happen today, <laughs> for sure. But the problem is, it's not really feasible, unless Thomas Neil Cream could be in two places in one time. Yeah. It's not really feasible that he was Jack the Ripper, because during the time of the killings, he was in prison in Illinois, so halfway around the world. And yeah. it's not like he could take a flight to get here and be here in a few hours. He'd have to get on a ship that takes forever yeah. to get here. Also, like, the modus operandi, that's very different. Yeah, sometimes killers might change, but in general, they tend to stick to one modus operandi, don't they? So I don't think serial killers change. I think they evolve and develop. But they wouldn't go from poisoning 
to brutal muti- mutilation yeah. back to poisoning. It's so vastly different, isn't it? Exactly. And also, Dr. Thomas Neil Cream, he was a very skilled surgeon. Uh, whereas Jack the Ripper, they think he had some experience with knives, basically. Yeah. But they don't think he was proficient. So he could have been a butcher, basically know someone's anatomy. But they don't think he was a proficient surgeon, whereas Neil was. Yeah. That and Whitechapel isn't his own, is it? It's Lambeth. Like, yeah. I just think this guy Billington's trying to bump up his profile a little bit. Particularly if he's, like, got a book out. You're just trying to sell more books. Yeah, I really don't see this one. Yeah. Well, it's not just Jack Billington. His lawyer, uh, Marshall Hall, oh, yeah. he probably didn't help the subject either <laughs> because he's claimed that there are two Thomas Neal, one cream, one just Thomas Neal, that look so alike. <laughs> so they have actually taken each other's places in prison before mm. and that allowed the other one to go out and commit crimes. Apparently, it, Thomas Neal cream was done for bigamy. He was taken to court in bigamy charges. But his alibi was that he was in prison in Sydney, which I don't understand. I only read this in one place because I haven't read any other places where it says that he was done for bigamy. Because I don't think he was. He married one person and she died. Uh, unless he married again, I don't see how he can have got done for bigamy. Yeah, but apparently his alibi was that he was in prison in Sydney, but the other Thomas Neal was in prison in Sydney. So we're thinking that he's an international serial killer... But so is this other Thomas Neal cream. (laughs) And they both land in prison at different times. The other Thomas Neal was the one that committed the murders, the Whitechapel killings, Jack the Ripper killings. There's a theory saying that he decided to take the fall for it as he's dying, just to free the other one. Yeah. It's like the other one wasn't even in the frame. What's the point? No one knew about these doppelgangers if they exist. He didn't have to do that. Yeah. I've got a feeling this Edward Marshall Hall or Sir Edward Marshall Hall, I should say. I think he might think of himself as some kind of, like, Agatha Christie type, even though she doesn't exist at this point. (laughs) Yeah, it's so far-fetched, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It doesn't seem at all feasible. Yeah, if this was some weird, like, crime novel, then I'd kind of understand it, but in real life... Yeah. Also, I think it's a great example for the Wikipedia page to put Cream himself... (laughs) as well (laughs) you've definitely read the wikipedia page so like the line below cream himself i love that because it's true though when you're being hanged you lose all control of your bodily functions like any other death yeah and like stuff happens like i I had some woman's womb fell out or something i think that was like one of the last women that was hanged in the uk ruth ellis was it ruth yeah her womb or something fell out of her her uterus Mm. or a fetus something like that jesus (laughs) so obviously you lose all bodily function so apparently (laughs) he was screaming out i am ejaculating (laughs) billington misheard which I think is quite funny, but it's also, I, I, I believe that. The worst time to do it as well. I must add that Billington wasn't the only person in the gallows that, that day. There were others, and they don't recall s- hearing anything. Yeah. Even if he was saying, like, I am Jack, that's not saying I am Jack the Ripper. Mm. Bit of a jump to make that conclusion. Yeah. And also, if he's bribing officials just to, like, slowly leave the prison to do his murders... Why would her, his brother officially need to help him get out of prison 10 years after the fact? Yeah. And bribe people then when he's already out. He might as well keep his trap shut because he's already out of prison. He's just going to draw attention to the fact that he's not in prison if he actually isn't in prison. Yeah. It seems very silly. Unless, are they saying that his brother petitioned to get his brother's lookalike <laughs> out of prison? <laughs> like, it makes no sense whatsoever. And this this is hardly, like, the era of Facebook. How can you find your own fucking dumb doppelganger? It's so far-fetched. Yeah. Is he just going around countries looking for someone that looks like him, saying, oh, you're, you're all criminal as well? You know what? We should just do prison time for each other. Let's just share. Yeah. Again, if, if this was a novel, I'd, like, believe it. But I think in real life, that's very hard. Mm. Even in a novel, I'd find it far-fetched. Yeah. Unless you're deliberately making yourself look like each other. Well, I'm not going to lie, right? He's not unremarkable looking. Mm. He's just got a tash and a top hat. (laughs) He looks pretty much like any other sort of semi-affluent person that would have lived in that time. Yeah. So I'm not going to rule out there are people that look like him. That's not my argument. (laughs) I'm sure there are people that look like him. I just don't believe any of this shit. Nah. And also, it's it's just too brutal. Because clearly he doesn't actually... 
want to watch those. He can't face watching them die. He just poisons and leaves and he tries to make some money off it. Yeah. I think they believed he was some kind of sadist, didn't they? Yeah. Just like the idea that they were in agony, but he didn't actually want to probably see it. Yeah. If he can't see someone dying from poisoning, I highly doubt he has the stones to gut people. Yeah. And literally mutilate them. I don't think he'd have it in him. Yeah. I just I just think he's a bit of a weirdo. I think he's <laughs> he's a sick bastard, but he's not Jack the Ripper sick. Yeah. I mean this guy reminded me slightly of it. Didn't they didn't say murdered people the same way. But um you know the Reddington Place guy? John. Oh, yeah. Can't yeah, remember yeah, what yeah. I that, said. That sick fuck, yeah. Because they both abortionists, and the Rillington Place guy, he definitely murdered his wife. So it's, it's kind of similar in some ways. And both would have been considered quite respectable at one point. Uh, I think they probably would, especially seeing that it's not exactly, especially in that time. I mean, leaving your wife, there's stigma around it. People like money. Yeah. Murder is easier. Guys get away with it. Yeah. Except when they don't. <laughs> yeah. And because I know the Rillington Place guy, he... He basically framed someone as well. I mean, yeah. someone died because of him. Yeah. Because he, he he visited prostitutes as well, didn't he? I think... I th- to be fair, isn't that like what they did back then? Especially if you're like semi-affluent? I know like everyone did it. Not everyone, but there's a certain type of man. There would have been a that... few people who had done it. Yeah. Basically, prostitution's a good business. Yeah. That's what we're saying. Unless, you know, you're being poisoned and stuff and mutilated. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, yeah, it's just a murder thing that sort of makes it lose appeal to me. Yeah. I was thinking of a career change, but I don't <laughs> think that's it. The, the slightly weird thing is that, um, like, the Daniel Stott thing, in a way, that is slightly different because most of the others are prostitutes. The others he did try and get money out of. Yeah. And Daniel Stott, he was sort of trying to get money out of. By banging his wife. Yeah. And his wife would have ended up inheriting the money. And he probably would have thought, oh, I'm going to marry her afterwards. And then I'm going to bump her off. Yeah. I do think that makes this guy quite bad in the sense that he would murder literally anyone just for money. Yeah. He doesn't have a type. Really. Yeah. Especially with Lou. We don't know if she was a prostitute. Kate, she was his mistress. Yeah. So, yeah, he doesn't have a type. So he could literally go for anyone. Yeah. His university thesis was on, like, the effects of chloroform as well. Yeah, that's kind of grim. Yeah. That's that's why sometimes doctors are the worst, aren't they, I think? Yeah, because they know how to get away with yeah, it as well. They, just, they know so much. I know you joked about Harold Chipman, but he's a prime case. Yeah. And especially if they're put in a position of power and trust, people just uh, automatically, instantly trust doctors because they have a duty of care to you. Yeah. Except if you're racist, because then you don't care. <laughs> I mean, you'll request a different doctor if the colour of the skin doesn't suit you. People won't understand that because I cut it out of the episode originally. So. Yeah. Well, I, 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 at least I remember the story, so yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. It might go in the outtakes. It might not. Yeah. You know, yeah, pay attention around Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was also reading there was at least four other women who died in his care. Yeah, yeah. So that's why, that's why I think at the beginning I said, well, at least ten. Yeah. Because they're the only ten confirmed. But I assume that there's probably a lot more. I don't think it's only the 10. Yeah, I hate to bring it back to Harold Shipman again, but... They convicted him for, like, a small number, but it could be as big as, like, 300 or something yeah, ridiculous. Something, like, that's the problem with doctors. They see so many people that it could be at any number of people. And particularly a doctor that moves about as well. Like this one, international. Yeah. It's weird if it's in one place, because you think, why are all these people dying? Well, it depends on what you're a doctor of, though. Like, if, if you specialise in caring for the elderly... I'm not going to automatically assume that you've killed a load of your patients because they're the elderly. Or even if they're just sick, Mm. you assume sick people will die. Yeah, I suppose. But I do think if it was in a short space of time, I think you would worry if that amount of people would die. Well, technically, this was a short space of time. Yeah. He was 42 when he died. Ten years of his life, he was in prison. He was only 26 when he moved to London. So Mm. that was just after Flora's death. 
So he didn't actually have that long out in the public sphere where he was actually murdering. Yeah. And yet he packed quite a few people in. If he's doing a lot of abortions on prostitutes as well. It could easily be botched and they die. Yeah. They're also not the most cared about in society as well, so... Yeah, so you wouldn't hear about it. Yeah, he could have just got forgotten about, so... Yeah, he wasn't actually out there for a while, but he managed to kill a lot of people in his time. Yeah. He was only 42, so 32 years... He was out of prison. He only trained in 19... He only finished his training in 19... Not 19, sorry. I keep saying 19. 1876? 75, 76? So he's 26. So that's like six years worth of killing. Yeah. Pretty much. He packed quite a lot in. Yeah. I mean, he only lived to like 42, didn't he? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I just did the maths 10 times over, Matt. Why are you questioning this? Oh, right. (laughs) I mean, I know I'm shit at maths, but I've got it in front of me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a lot of killing, man. I've yeah. only just realised how much. I just assumed, oh, he's older. And I'm looking, I was like, no, he's only 42. Yeah, it's good he's hanged. I think it's good there's the death penalty back then. Yeah. He would have just killed more. <laughs> he would have done. If he was just in prison, I'm assuming he'd probably end up killing people in prison. Yeah, if he found a way of getting strychnine or any, well, there's no saying he would have just stuck to strychnine as well yeah because he only used that for the last few yeah like with kate with it was chloroform with flora we don't really know because it's assumed it was consumption and they only realized like much later what 15 years later mm. that oh he probably murdered her as well so it was only with the prostitute it was only starting from um daniel stott because mary faulkner and miss stack weren't they botched abortions I, yeah pretty sure yeah it's only starting from daniel stott so it was only the last one, two, three, four, five murders. Yeah. So he could have switched it up. He probably would have eventually yeah. if he was still out. He, this this one is quite scary in that he could have used so many ways if he'd like, you know, not got caught. If it wasn't for his like need for attention and money. Yeah, he would have still been out there roaming. Yeah. I think he probably still would have gotten away with it even if he was an attention whore. It's just he decided to be an attention whore to the wrong person. Yeah. If it wasn't that police officer, if it was anyone else, I think he probably would have carried on getting away with it. Yeah. Because the police officer connected with Scotland Yard and Scotland Yard realised he knew way too much about this case than he should have done. Yeah. If it was any other member of the public, they would have thought, ah, he's in the know. And they wouldn't really have questioned it. Yeah. I do, I do like the idea of him giving guided tours <laughs> while he's, like, murder himself, you know. Yeah. I bet that Jack the Ripper, he's, like, still alive. Like, he's, like, an evil being, a monster <laughs> type thing. And he's the person that's been giving Jack the Ripper tours around Whitechapel that we never seem to be able to go on, Matt. Yeah. yeah it's got to be some really old guy. Oh, it's just the spirit of Jack the Ripper. He could be ex- um, possessing someone. True. Tree. Yeah, it's lucky I know my exorcism. Let's go on the Jack the Ripper tour, Matt. Yeah, but then that person would be doing what Jack the Ripper's doing, wouldn't they? They were possessed by him. Maybe they're better at hiding bodies. Oh, God. Maybe Jack the Ripper actually lived longer than people believed, and the span of killings was longer than people believed. It's just he got better at hiding bodies. He decided, oh, I don't really want to be a showman anymore. Yeah. It's getting too dangerous. I'll just hide the bodies better or move somewhere else. Because that's a, another theory, like he moved somewhere else and continued killing. Yeah. Well, the one thing I would say about Jack the Ripper, though, is you've got to be so pleased you've got away with that. I would be if I was Jack. I mean, you'd be living. When you get close to death, you're thinking, how did I get away with that? Yeah, yeah I'm just wondering why he didn't write a book or something before he died. So, by the way, you guys, I fooled all of you guys. Because he did write letters, didn't he? He wrote, or he's assumed to. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm just wondering why he never wrote a book, unless he did, and like his ancestors have hid it away or destroyed it. Yeah. Because they don't want people to know. It's like descendants of Nazis. They don't want people to know. They change their name. They hide everything about them. Yeah, I just can't believe he would stop suddenly. I think he got imprisoned, or he was killed, or he moved away. I don't think he just lived. And just stopped. Yeah. But then if he was imprisoned, he would have got out at some point. I don't know if he was in prison. He could have died in prison. Depends what he got done for. Possibly. And so it depends also how old he would have been at the time. He wouldn't have necessarily lived as long back then. True. Hmm. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't do too much about Jack the Ripper. Right? Just in case you want to do a Jack the Ripper episode <laughs> yeah. at some point. 
Or maybe maybe if we ever get successful enough to get an intern, I'll get an intern to comb through everything we've ever recorded and just cut out all the Jack-related bits and then we can compile that into an episode. Yeah. That poor intern. <laughs> that and getting sexually harassed by you, Jesus Christ. Me? Poor Jimmy. I've named the intern Jimmy. <laughs> oh, great. It doesn't matter what his name's actually going to be. It's Jimmy now. I, I really don't want to know the surname, so... <laughs> Anyway, I think that's all we can really say about Thomas Neil Cream. I mean, he was fucked up and we're kind of glad he died, but it yeah. should have been sooner. He never should have been let out of prison in the first place. Shame on you, governors and people of Illinois Justice Department for letting this psychopath out. Yeah. I bet, I bet it was because he was a doctor as well and he had money. Yeah, that's why. They bribed him. If there's any other like person, they wouldn't have got away with it. Yeah, rightly so. You shouldn't get away with it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that's it. It's an interesting case, isn't it? It is really interesting. The thing is, I had it on my computer for a while, and I don't know why I never actually suggest... Because I was telling you before, I see so many things, I take a screenshot of it and then just yeah. save it for six months later. Did you get it from River? No, I don't think so. Because, um, you know, Eddie oh, Marson. yeah, Eddie Marson. Was he meant to be, like, the spirit of cream or something? Yeah. Ah, oh, that makes so much more sense now. Yeah, because I, I looked up on the BBC, because uh, when I put the name in, it came up with a BBC thing. I was like, well, what was this about? And then, yeah, it, it was from River. I was like, I recognise that guy. <laughs> ah, that makes sense. Yeah, but no, I didn't get it from River. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when I got it. I don't know if I watched River before or after. Yeah. But it's like the Wallander thing. I keep forgetting it's set in Sweden. And the references, yeah, it just goes over my head. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, it's interesting. So, if there's anything that you little listeners would like to contribute, anything we got wrong, fine, just let us know at the dog seduction at gmail dot com. You can also Facebook us and tweet us, and I guess you can YouTube us as well. But I like stopped reading the comments. Uh, unless it's like a short one or it's a nice one then i'll just like give you a thumbs up if it's a bad one if i'm in a bad mood i'm gonna take it out on you i'm not gonna lie if you if you're gonna be shits and i'm just not feeling it i am gonna take out my fury on you yeah we we record this podcast especially for you so you know don't be yeah it's definitely for youtube listeners i mean they're definitely an afterthought for me <laughs> yeah. but seriously if you're listening on youtube and you enjoy us that's great if you're going to be a cunt, uh, go ahead, be a cunt, because sometimes I'm in a bad mood and I just need an outlet. Yeah. Um, other times I'm just going to respond K. You're going to do what? <laughs> I'm just going to respond the letter K. All right. Because uh, according to Chris, that drives people crazy. <laughs> Which it would to me, actually. Yeah, it would. It's, it's quite an annoying thing to respond to someone. <laughs> K. K, I think we should wrap this up, K. 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 <laughs> K. K. So, so bye. Bye. I wonder if we can still get strychnine. I, I think you can, actually. Yeah, so... I'll be in my hands with glee. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay, bye. Bye.